It's the second day of April, and Dan Oley is cruising the tributaries of Green Bay on the hunt for northern pike. I always come down here to see if I can see any fish sort of staging to come up, but it doesn't really look like it. This would normally be a good time to spot adult pike as they head inland from Lake Michigan for the shallow wetlands, streams, and even road culverts where they spawn. But this year, Oli's not spotting many pike in the tea-colored water. For many of the fish, the spawning run is already done. Yeah, it's pretty pretty wild spring. The warm temperatures really bumped up all of the fish migration, the spring migrants um, from walleye, suckers, sturgeon, northern pike are at least four weeks ahead of schedule. Um, it's, and it's all temp water temperature related. That really hot spell in mid-March really, really started things um, really early. Oli is a graduate student in Pete McIntyre's lab at the Center for Limnology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's working on a master's degree thesis exploring the nature of pike migrations. The core question is, is really are northern pike returning to the same areas that they were born in to spawn every year? That is, are they, do they show natal site fidelity? And the way we're at answering that question is through otolith microchemistry. Otoliths, tiny disks of calcium carbonate, often called ear stones, sit near a fish's brain and help it detect sounds and vibrations, as well as orient itself in its 3D underwater world. For researchers, otoliths are recorders of a fish's life history. Not only do they have growth rings, much like trees, but they take in trace elements of the surrounding habitat as they grow. Since the water chemistry of an inland stream is different from a great lake, these changes show up in the otoliths of the pike Oli studies. A young fish is, is born in a tributary, stays there for a little, a little while, migrates back out to Green Bay or Lake Michigan to grow up, and, and when it's mature enough to spawn, going back into a tributary network, we can, we can detect those subtle changes in the otolith chemistry. In several tributaries around Green Bay, Oli has set up hoop nets that allow pike to swim upstream to spawn and then corral them as they head back downstream. On this particular day, only one net turns up a pike. Oli and his field assistant, Joseph Brooks, remove the pike from the net and take a series of size and weight measurements, as well as scale samples and fin clippings. Then they remove the otoliths. Oli needs to catch 10 fish in each of his nets to have enough evidence to take back to the lab. Once there, he can analyze the chemical makeup of each otolith to try to reveal if pike should join the ranks of fish like salmonids and suckers that return to their birthplace to spawn, or if pike simply head inland in the spring and use any suitable habitat to lay their eggs. So apart from being a really cool science experiment, this has some really strong management implications. And that is if, it's pretty simple, if, if pike go, are going back to the same areas to spawn, that means that if you're going to restore a wetland or create a new wetland habitat for these fish to spawn in, uh, you, you're going to have to seed it somehow uh, with young fish that will imprint on that water body, and then that, then that way they'll find it. And if, if the opposite is true, if these fish are really just sort of cruising the coast of Green Bay and waiting for the water temperatures to, to get warm and cue in on that, you can reasonably expect to build a pristine wetland habitat and just leave it be and the fish will find it on their own. The answer to his question, Oli says, might one day help fisheries managers better protect future populations of one of Wisconsin's biggest and most popular sport fish.